start is so I'm really content to start here. Um, I'm of course not going. I'm going to fool you by giving you a title in uh, Spanish, but I'm incapable, unfortunately, of giving you my lecture in Spanish or my thoughts in Spanish. But it's for me a very interesting moment to discover your university and to be here because not only do you have this fantastic school of architecture with this amazing building that I'm astonished by, uh, but you also have plans to begin in the coming year a program in curatorial studies and you have an absolutely amazing facility of a museum with an astounding collection of photography. So the question of how do you exhibit architecture, which is my question today, is, is your question too. So, uh, so I'll just share with you some thoughts. Um, as you can see from this uh, dual screen, uh, I wear two hats. I have two activities, as Dean just explained to you. I am at once a historian and a curator, so I want to speak to you a little bit from both perspectives. It's a very funny kind of a feedback loop. Um, and I also want to tell you a little bit at the very end about the last exhibition I, I did because it was an exhibition that tried to take the, the topic that is our topic today, which is how do you exhibit architecture? As you can see from the beginning, I say it's a paradox. Um, you really can't exhibit architecture, but you can, you can make an exhibition of architecture. Um, and I want to take it even to another, a further level, which is, in a certain way, how do I complete my two parts? How do you exhibit research? How do you exhibit thought? How do you exhibit process? So one thing that you'll see in the entire presentation today uh, is my fascination with the fact that since you cannot physically exhibit architecture, if you really want to see an exhibition of architecture, you can just walk around the campus. Um, since you cannot physically exhibit architecture, what becomes really interesting is to exhibit the thought process of architecture, the design process, to come up with ways, in fact, in which the exciting way in which designers and architects uh, think can itself be on display. So that architecture does not become an object that is mystifying for the general public, but actually becomes a process that they can appreciate, connect with, uh, and really enter into conversation with the work that you do now as students and later on as as professionals. So I'm going to start with a little bit of the history of the architectural exhibition and the history of this paradox. As you can see, for me, it's both a challenge, but I also think it has absolutely extraordinary uh, potentials. This began not only uh, when I took on the full-time job for almost a decade of working in the building that you, uh, in, that's on the site that you see here in construction. I hope you recognize New York. Uh, although you might, first of all, wonder where you are between this English neo-Gothic uh, church and this Japanese house in the shadow of it. We are at the Museum of Modern Art in 1955, uh, and the building where I work as curator is on the site of where the construction is happening. But in the garden, in the lower right, uh, what you see under uh, on display is a, a, a Japanese house. Japanese temple, really, a reproduction of one was first built in Japan and brought and put on display in the garden at the Museum of Modern Art for, uh, for two seasons. It was, until recently, the most popular architectural exhibition ever done at MoMA. So it introduces the problem for us immediately. The most popular exhibition of architecture was the time when a building was put in a garden, which is, in fact, if you will, a kind of roofless, uh, a roofless without roof uh, uh, exhibition space. Uh, also, <laughs> the incredible irony that the most popular exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art was of a 17th century Japanese house. Um, but on top of it, it raises our whole issue of what I'm going to say is the theme. This is the title of my future book, but it is also the title of a lecture series I gave a number of years ago at the National Gallery in Washington where I tried to take on the history of exhibiting architecture since 1750. I wanted to ask the question, why, if it's nearly impossible to exhibit architecture, has the fact of the architectural exhibition grown in prominence, in uh, mutated in forms, and become really a, a culture uh, since the 18th century? How does an impossibility become a culture, I suppose, is one way. And my thesis, or my hypothesis, of what always characterizes the architecture exhibition, which is at once its paradox and its possibility, is this, difficult for me to translate into Spanish, out of sight, this is a play on words, out of sight in plain view. So always the architecture exhibition starts with 
one key activity. It takes something out of its normal <coughs> context and puts it in a new context. And that activity of what I could call deracination, recontextualization, that gesture is the fundamental thing that's going to keep everything that we're going to look at today uh, in connection uh, and I think uh, create the tensions that it is, if it's difficult to design a building, it's equally difficult to design an architectural exhibition. So let's uh, look at the problem for a minute. There's a growing and vast literature, and I'm sure as the library will be filling with these texts as the curatorial program here begins, uh, on the fact that architectural exhibitions don't really show architecture, they show other media, they show representations of architecture. Here we have, bef uh, during the decades in the second half of the 18th century, when the architectural exhibition is going to be invented, a kind of demonstration of that. On the left, one of a pair of very famous uh, paintings uh, by the Italian painter Panini, uh, in which you see a painting gallery plaqued with all of these paintings of the antiquities of Rome. So we can bring the entire history of ancient architecture. This is the reference point, of course, uh, for all uh, academies of training, including the Academy de San Fernando in Madrid, uh, but architecture itself can't enter the gallery. It only enters the gallery in painted form, as a picture. Likewise here, this famous painting by the French painter Hubert Robert, uh, who is imagining the transformation of the Grand Galerie at the Louvre into a public museum. Uh, needless to say, he imagines that the public museum will be the forerunner of the one-man show, Every object in the Louvre is designed by Hubert Robert, is painted by Hubert Robert. He also imagined the very first uh, skylight, so this is extremely important in the history of museums and lighting. But for my purposes, these stand in for the idea that architecture enters by the means of another art. First by painting, later by drawing, and we'll see by photography. Uh, now, one way that we could call attention to a work of architecture in nature, if we wanted really to um, uh, display buildings, to display built works of uh, architecture would be to take all of the technology of the art museum to outside of the museum into the building. So here we have the display case taken outside uh, to place this building so that we'll look at it differently even though it hasn't been moved. Uh, speaking of Latin America, this is one example that I discovered in my travels in Latin America for the show on Latin American architecture, but this is a 19th century building. This is the house of the, one of the earliest presidents of the Argentine Republic, Sarmiento, in the Tigre district of Buenos Aires, uh, which becomes a historic monument. We could also go to Lenin's hut in St. Petersburg and the like. So a little bit of a uh, extravagant case. Or we could simply take the whole textual apparatus of the museum labels, text panels, introduction, and start to turn the environment itself into a display of itself. So we can bring that apparatus out. If you walk around Paris or many cities, you find these historical panels. This is one in New York. Uh, so something, this is one of my favorites. This is a, a posthumous work by the great Colombian uh, modernist, uh, Rogelio Salmona. This work was finished just after his death in a, a very uh, poor district of Medellin in Colombia. Uh, cultural center for the, uh, the district of Moravia. Uh, and here we have not only uh, Salmona's architecture, but we have an explanation of what we're looking at. So these espejos de agua uh, is explained to us that this is not simply a fountain. It is a heritage of the tradition of the hacienda, of the courtyard, of the Alhambra. So we are told the building is curated uh, here, if you will. Uh, or here, this is one of my favorites. And you see these people are obviously taking photographs on the Yohampas, which are obviously, they're not simply a way of getting around, they're an, an attempt to degustar el tiempo. Um, so those are examples of taking it outside. So in this uh, book that I'm currently writing, I decided not to write an entire uh, history, but rather to answer the question that I posed for you at the very beginning, which is, if the architectural exhibition is nearly impossible, if you almost cannot display architecture. Not only why have there been so many, but what if I turned the question around, I asked myself, what if instead of writing the 100th article about the fact that you can only exhibit representations, doesn't get us very far, I just told you, there's the, the plot line is finished on that one. Uh, what if instead I asked the question, why do we continue to make exhibitions on architecture? There must be 
something that the architectural exhibition creates for architecture that architecture doesn't create in its in own internal activity. What are the possibilities of this? So here's my out of sight in plain view, and I'll just give you some of the themes. So the first chapter deals with the fact that the architecture exhibition creates a space for public debate. It makes architecture into a matter of public concern. It enters it into the entire network of criticism, cafe culture, uh, all that you like, with the difficult admission of architecture into uh, the salon. And interestingly, one of the themes that will be dealt with in this chapter is that as the exhibition uh, is born and begins to grow, it's not simply that architects find a way to be allowed to send their representations of their projects to hang next to the paintings and the sculptures and the engravings, but the nature of representing architecture itself changes. There's a radical transformation of architectural drawing in the late 18th and early 19th century by the fact that it can be uh, displayed. And also we have, for the first time, the desire to create incredibly legible images of something that doesn't yet exist. So the architectural exhibition's relationship to that which does not yet exist is also interesting. This is uh, Charles de Bailly, who's a French architect but also a painter, sending a project for his great Chateau de Montmoussa to the Salon. And you'll see how he's trying to make it look like the great landscape paintings and the great history paintings, because the problem always of the architect is how to make the public want to look at architecture as much as they want to look at uh, paintings and sculpture. This is Sir John Soane, one of the most important uh, British architects of the late 18th, early 19th century. He's also the architect of one of the first purpose-built art galleries. Uh, this is the art gallery of Dulwich College, uh, which is a secondary school south of London. The architects were allowed to, like everyone else, to send one work to the annual exhibition of the Royal Academy in London. Well, the problem is it's extremely difficult to understand a work of architecture from a single image. You need a plan, section, elevation. You need multiple images in order to understand the fact of the complexity of the space of architecture and the fact that architecture is really only discovered over time and through movement. Uh, and so we see here, this is not actually drawn by Sohn. Here we have also the appearance of a whole new profession, people who render images for architects, who make the architectural project even more exciting than maybe the architect was capable himself of doing it. This is uh, Gandhi creating an omnibus <coughs> view of all of the aspects of it in one stone sheet to get into the salon. So this issue of public debate, so we have criticism of architecture, discussion of architecture, discussion of the, the relationship of architecture to the construction of the city, to public good, to values. We'll come to a, uh, a, a sort of great moment during the French Revolution, when most architects are out of work, uh, and it is decided to ask architects to enter a competition, they're called the competitions of the year two, from the decision of the French revolutionaries to restart time uh, in 1792. Uh, and in 1794, we have these competitions of the year two. And approximately 100 architectural projects are given out. Many of the most interesting ones are given out for institutions that have never existed before. So the new types of institutions of revolutionary culture. This is probably the first architectural exhibition to ever be accompanied by a catalog. Uh, and so we know exactly what was uh, sent in. But it means that the debate over what form society should take and the debate over what form uh, architecture should take come hand in hand in this exhibition, which is thrown open to the public. So we could say that, of course, from the moment that there were schools of architecture and people started to work on paper, they probably did what you were doing right before you came here. They probably put it on the wall and talked about it. That's not what I'm talking about. For me, the architectural exhibition needs the missing thing in that it needs the public. So you don't generally ask all of Pamplona to come in and discuss with you what's going on in the studio. It's an educational activity. I'm interested in the moment when the public is admitted and what happens to the mechanism of the architectural exhibition, feedback mechanism again, to make architecture into a subject of discussion. So that's the topic of the first chapter. It has many, many examples. Uh, and like the entire book, 
What it tries to do is to find the origin point of an activity and to trace it on. The interesting thing about all these forms of exhibition practice that I'm going to show you a few examples of is I can find as a historian their origin, but none of them becomes meaningless. So that you could say that the repertory of possibilities for architectural exhibitions has continued to expand over the some 250 years of it. Uh, this is an extremely well-known drawing. It's not quite as big as it's projected here. Uh, it was entered into a competition to design a monument for uh, Frederick the Great, the King of Prussia, about a decade after he died, but also to transform this uh, plaza uh, into a public plaza uh, at the entrance to Berlin. And the competition was not won by this drawing. History of competitions is almost always the second prize that becomes the history of architecture. The first prize is built, unfortunately. The second prize becomes <laughs> history of architecture. Anyway, this is one of those cases. And this drawing has another importance for us because not only was it put on display, not only was there a huge public debate over what form Berlin should take in the 1790s, there was also a debate over the relationship of the king to society in a moment when the French had a guillotine on the Place de la Concorde. Um, but also, a very young man, 17 years old, Carl Friedrich Schinkel, was studying music. He saw this drawing and he said, architecture can embody the highest ideals of a society. I'm going to, I'm going to train as an architect. So we also have the exhibition as a stimulus uh, to, uh, to others. And we could carry that story on. Interestingly, little known fact, the National Gallery of Britain in London, on Trafalgar Square, the very first exhibition that ever took place there was an architecture exhibition. The building was not yet complete, but one wing was roofed over and uh, could be used. Uh, there was a huge competition to redesign the Houses of Parliament. Think about it, the seat of parliamentary government, uh, and which had burned in a huge fire in 1834. Major competition. Uh, many, many drawings were sent in, many projects, and the jury has to decide uh, the winner, obviously. And uh, there starts a public outcry in the press. Why is this jury going to make a decision behind closed walls? We want to see the projects, and the projects were installed in the future National Gallery uh, of Art. Uh, and the decision became a matter of public uh, discussion about the very place where legislative activities took place. The second chapter of my book, I'm not going to tell you all eight chapters, but just to give you a little bit of this idea of the research that I'm doing and so that you can think about the longer history of architectural exhibitions. And I hope in a way you can also see that when I turn more egotistically in the second half of the lecture to my own activities, that I'm also learning from all this history as a, as a curator, uh, picking up elements for it, uh, from it, uh, not only techniques, but also obviously uh, aspirations. So. I'm an architectural historian, and uh, in chapter two of this book, I'm putting forth the idea that to make the history of architecture, you need to be able to move buildings. You need to be able to arrange them in chronological order, because, in fact, we don't build the city from north to south in chronological order. Architecture does not arrange itself in space, where it's originally found um, by um, chronology. So the only way to create a history uh, uh, an illustrated history is either to write a book and to create images where buildings are placed into a new uh, setting, or even better, to place them in a new setting in space, to create a gallery in which you can create the uh, history of architecture. I start here with, as you're about to start, a curating uh, degree. This is the origin of the words curator as somebody who a curate originally is somebody who takes care of things in the church. A curator as somebody who moves art objects into a new arrangement is a late 18th century invention. Uh, this is an image of Alexandre Lenoir, uh, who was a, uh, a very bad painter, but a brilliant curator, uh, who is at the um, Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, where the kings of France are buried, trying to convince the French revolutionaries not to attack the royal tombs as symbols of the monarchy and of oppression, but rather to treasure them as symbols of French genius. 
uh, and from that will become the creation of his great Museum of French Monuments. So the second chapter is looking at moving things around and placing them in historical context. On the left, the gallery of Casas, who created a experiential history of ancient architecture, moving from the Egyptians through the Greeks to the Romans uh, at the edge of the, um, at the Ecole des in Paris. Counterexample, Sir John Soane, who wants a kind of poetic history. He says, I don't want a chronological uh, uh, you know, kind of law-driven history. I want a poetic history of the association of objects. So we get all of the ideologies of how one could think of the relationship of the historical past to understanding the evolution of architectural practice to its meaning for the present played out in the 19th century dream of creating an architecture museum. This is the first uh, short-lived but somewhat sustained Museum of Architecture itself ever to be created. It was created in the years around the first World's Fair of 1851. The Architecture Museum in London, here you see um, a daguerreotype of the galleries of it. It only lasted for uh, less than 10 years because nobody came. So uh, this is, again, the problem of the architecture exhibition is how to actually get a non-professional audience into a architectural display. We're going to come to that my, being still my problem. It was already a problem in 1851. The, most of the people who came to this museum were people who were creating neo-Gothic buildings in England and wanted to learn, so it was a teaching, became a teaching museum, always nearly impossible to get the public to come. The third chapter is going to deal with the creation of the origins of the open air museum. So the idea of moving buildings uh, that are no longer used and putting them on display. And they, that takes its origin in the World's Fairs of the middle of the 19th century right into uh, recent past. Uh, so Crystal Palace, it's in the context of the World's Fairs too that we get the first great displays of photographs uh, representing the capacity to create an entire place through its architecture. But also, most importantly for me, is the birth in 1867 in, this is the great, you just told me that this building was a teaching machine. This is a kind of machine of display. The great um, palace of ex the exhibition of 1867, which was a radial system for organizing all of the world's industrial and uh, artistic pro products according to a system. Uh, but much of it didn't fit, and so many countries were allowed to build little pavilions to house their national displays outside. The interesting thing is that once they, once they said, oh, we're going to build a building that represents Norway in Paris, what should it look like? And this instigates a huge debate over what is a Norwegian architecture. So all of these 19th century debates over what is national architecture become uh, rather almost histrionic in the what I call export architecture, the need to export your architecture, represent your country abroad. Then the problem becomes, what happens when I take the pavilion, am I going to demolish it, or am I going to bring it back home? I have just written ten, read 10 articles that my pavilion was incredibly appreciated in Paris. Am I going to demolish it? So many times they're brought back home. They're both catalysts for discussion, but they are at the origins of the open air museum, of which perhaps the grandfather of all is Skansen, which is an entire island in the harbor of Stockholm that has collected buildings uh, from uh, around the country. And this, my favorite, which is the Village Museum in Bucharest, which I recommend to you if you ever find yourself in Romania. But the, um, the other thing that is interesting here is a debate in the late 19th century over whether the national brilliance in architecture is represented by famous architects or is represented by vernacular buildings. So here too the origins of the debate over authenticity in architecture. Much, much more we can do with that. I want to go quickly through my history so we can get uh, into the more recent past and my own activities as a historian in the galleries. But it is, if we were writing a history of housing reform and housing debate, it is the ability to design model houses uh, that also begins in the World's Fair. This was across the street from the Crystal Palace in 1851, Prince Albert, husband of uh, Queen Victoria, financed the construction of a model house for workers. Now, we're completely out of context. This is in the richest Hyde Park area of London, uh, where potential investors can see 
uh, what this would look like. These are people who had never been to a slum in their life, but they're going to be able to see what an improved slum dwelling might look like. Uh, and this is really, in a certain sense, the birth act of the housing movement um, in, uh, in, in England. So it, is, it turns out to be amazing in the next chapter of the book, which looks at the issues of housing reform and urban reform in relationship to exhibitions that I am able to write a history of the housing reform movement and a history of urban reform movement entirely as a history of exhibitions. So, this could take us up to the Bauhaus, the Model House, Corbusier, could even write a history of modern architecture, up to Marcel Breuer's House in the Garden, extremely influential vision of what a post-war American uh, house might look like in the suburbs, ironically enough, place it in the middle of the city to reform the suburbs. Um, but here we have extremely effective means through full-scale temporary buildings. It's almost a kind of one-to-one -one model. And that one-to-one -one model, taking its form from reform to the next chapter of the book, which is on the invention of the avant-garde. And I claim there that the avant-gardes in architecture can only exist through the mechanism of the exhibition, because you need a means of communication for your ideas. Here is Tadlin's famous monument to the Third International being paraded through the streets of, um, uh, of what was to become Leningrad and then inserted in a gallery. So let's segue to the place of my activity in the last decade and my ideas about how to turn some of these historical observations into uh, a plan of action for what could be a meaningful architectural exhibition in 2018. Here we are at MoMA. Uh, and you can see some of the uh, mystique of MoMA. This is the uh, first page of the first publication on architecture at MoMA, the catalog of the exhibition that gave us the name The International Style in 1932. It's also the foundation act of the Department of Architecture. It's a surprising fact to think that the Museum of Modern Art is the oldest sustained Department of Architecture anywhere in the world. So. The Museum of Modern Art is the oldest uh, architectural department. That's a really interesting paradox for you. Uh, and we always think, OK, the 1932 show is very no well known. It launched the idea of the international style. It tried to reform the taste of Ameri the American public, but also the American architectural uh, profession. But yet, if you read the first line of this catalog, it says, expositions and exhibitions have perhaps changed the character of American architecture of the last 40 years more than any factor. So the first catalog tells you that I, we're building on an exhibition culture that is 40 years old. They're referring, of course, to the Chicago World's Fair, which comes in the next sentence. As late as the 1970s, we find Peter Blake, who was an architect and sometime curator at MoMA, writing an article in which he says, architecture is an art, and MoMA is its prophet. <laughs> I don't know why you guys say, here's art as religion, I guess. Um, so. I think we'll skip over this. Here's the 1932 fair, uh, sorry, 1932 exhibition, the Corbusier room here. Uh, you see, interestingly, we're dealing with representations in the form of very boring exhibition design, incredibly boring <laughs> exhibition design. It's always amazing that this exhibition had such an incredible impact and such, uh, so much press and, had, uh, and has so much mystique built about it. And then when you see it, these little models on, with these pedestals with skirts on them to hide the wires for the lights, a uh, little plan next to it there. But then mm -hmm. photography as the thing that the public will understand, but <coughs> photography re-printed um, so that everything is the same size so that it looks like the painting galleries. Everything kind of lined up there. Here's the Bauhaus room. But the most two interesting things emerge here already. One is Architecture versus design. Since I know also in this school, you very strong uh, tradition and curriculum in teaching design. 1932, this is the first exhibition of the future Department of Architecture. Here we are in the Frank Lloyd Wright Room. 1934 is the first exhibition of the future Department of First Industrial Art, Later Design. Uh, this is the machine art of um, Philip Johnson. Now, on the one hand, the designers have it all over the architects because the designers can actually show real objects. Right? Uh, and the architects have to show models and photographs and drawings as far as the public can understand. They have to bring these substitution objects. They can't bring the architecture itself, per se, into the gallery. On the other hand, 
to walk into a gallery of a museum of art and discover a airplane propeller springs from heavy machinery is also a kind of radical decontextualization, recontextualization into this kind of Brancusi-esque uh, installation done by Philip Johnson. So there are differences and shared factors between architecture and design from the very beginning to get married at MoMA in interesting ways. Also, I want to insist on the institutional uh, framework. So I'm not so sure if this 1932 show, we're back in the Bauhaus room here, uh, had taken place in a school of architecture, we would have had the same impact. It took place, first of all, in the Museum of Modern Art. But where was the Museum of Modern Art in 1932? It was on the 12th and 13th floor of this neo-Renaissance building. So you went into this heavily decorated building, took the elevator up, and saw this vision of an architecture that is totally the contrary of what contemporary New York looks like. So the, re the relationship between the institutional context and literally the physical context. Equally interesting, there's the Bauhaus room. A few rooms later, this room, often forgotten, or occupying more place in the history of housing than in the history of architecture. This was a room on the problem of housing. <laughs> and here, the identical size photographs are photographs of the slums of New York, contrasted with a new German uh, Siedlung or housing project in the modern style. So this does a number of things that are interesting for us. It represents the desire to use the museum as an agent of change and reform, and not simply about taste, but actually about living conditions, social conditions, and the like. But it also raises a very interesting question, which is, can you show things in a museum that you don't admire? Because usually when you put something in a museum, it means that you're, in a sense, putting it in what is a museum, as the Temple of the Muses. You're saying, this is great. This is excellent. If you come in here, somebody is telling you that this is a, a work of exceptional excellence, worthy of your all, your devotion. What happens if you want to use the museum to horrify people and say, should people really be living here? So that is, I think, a very interesting thing that is emerging in as a tension uh, there. Uh, this leads up to my hero, and I'll end with her, and then we'll segue to, I'll show you briefly some of the things that I've been up to in the last 10 years in this, in this institution. So the museum moves after the first two years from this building to this townhouse, this one. And we're on West 53rd Street, 1934 into a house that had belonged to the Rockefeller family, so this is not a bad district. Uh, and uh, in it, my hero, Catherine Bauer, you can see the average age of a curator at MoMA uh, in 1934. She's an advisor to the housing section of the 1932 show. She publishes this incredibly authoritative study on modern housing, and then she helps to create this exhibition, the housing exhibition of the city of New York, 1936, and it takes place in this house. So you've got to imagine entering this very fancy house, one of the best addresses in New York, just off Fifth Avenue, and you see, first of all, she's a master of super graphics, uh, of large scale things. She's documenting <coughs> recent construction, and she wants to do two things. She wants to improve the quality of housing for poor people, and she wants to actually change the legislation of the, of the United States and of the city of New York. This exhibition will play a major role in the passing of federal legislation for something that's now forgotten in the United States called public housing, uh, and also uh, for the creation of the Department of Housing of the city of New York. Uh, so what happens when you come in? You have two choices. You can go through this door, and unfortunately I don't have any photographs of what happens when you go into this room. This was a room taken out of a slum dwelling, a house, a very unhealthy, crowded house in the worst slums of New York, and moved to Fifth Avenue so that people could see the conditions in which people were living in the slums of New York. And in the room next to it, Philip Johnson and others helped design a perfectly suitable room for a lower income family. Of course, they had Breuer's tubular steel furniture, they had a coffee table with the international style and recent publications of the Museum of Modern Art. This is a very somewhat naive vision, uh, but this idea of contrast between 
something you're going to be horrified by, and the capacity of architecture and design to improve this, the um, situation. So she went on, super graphics and statistics, there's no need to wait for the school of Rem Koolhaas to find the display techniques of using sublime statistics. A model of a proposed housing project for the Lower East Side of New York and special invitations to city officials to come to the museum to have it explained to them. So the idea of the museum, this is the key thing, why she's my heroine, the museum as activist, the museum as a agent for change, even in the midst of the depression. The last room was a consultation office in which you could sit down with somebody and talk about the relationship of the banking system to your housing needs. So we don't need to wait for the current wave of relational aesthetics where somebody's going to come talk to you on the ramps of the Guggenheim. You could have a conversation in the exhibition. Here's the Museum of Modern Art as it was finally built on, for its 10th anniversary. They were desperately hoping that Corbusier would come back, so they put the address on the roof. Uh, but they also created the first museum in the United States in which you do not go up a staircase to get into the building. You do not aspire to remove yourself from the condition of the contemporary world. You walk through a revolving door, up till this point used only for banks and shops, into a glass lobby where you can already see where you're going. So a complete rethinking of the relationship of the museum to everyday life. Temporary quarters with this Bauhaus exhibition, 1938, in a rented shop front. Many uh, important exhibitions take place there. Here is the exhibition Brazil Builds. Here's the extraordinary architecture of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts exhibition. Let's uh, spend a few minutes, if you'll bear with me for maybe 20 minutes or so, I'd like to talk to, about, to you about what I have been up to since I went to the museum. This is a photograph I took the first morning that I was working at the Museum of Modern Art in 2007. It was stupid of me to take it in the morning because I got there, you get to work before the museum opens its doors. So these are just the first people arriving. This is the Museum of Modern Art on a very, very quiet day. However, I was on my way to the Venice Architectural Biennale soon thereafter, and I realized that I could already study it with an app. So if I really wanted to hang out in the cafe or stay on the Vaporetto, no need to go uh, to look at all these exhibitions, all this stuff on the wall. Um, you now could look at your iPhone and you don't have to listen to this lecture. So what does it mean to be an architectural curator in the world of the information revolution of the personal device where you can no longer walk down the sidewalk because somebody is studying a phone and forgot that the sidewalk is a means of transportation? Uh, what, what is the purpose of a museum, particularly a museum that is going to represent, going to use architectural representations? They don't even have the aura of an original Picasso. Uh, what, it, why in the world do architectural exhibitions? I'm sorry to say that I have not solved that question. I just decided if that's just the beginning of the day, there are so many people in this building, I'm going to take advantage of the paradox that museums today are among the most crowded public spaces that we have, uh, and I'm going to try to figure out how I can capture and address uh, and create something uh, that will interest these people. I'm even going to take advantage of the fact that at the Museum of Modern Art, they probably came to see Jackson Pollock or Picasso or something else, but maybe I can capture them. So I have to be a bit histrionic as I'm trying to capture them both from Picasso and from their iPhone and get them into my gallery. Now, in, this was the gallery that I was in charge of for any number of years. This is an exhibition that I did of the things that I had collected for the collection. So I'm only showing it to say that what I'm going to show you is not the full range of the activity that I undertook as a curator at MoMA. I also brought many new things into the uh, collection, particularly trying to concentrate on Latin American work. These are some exquisite models by the Brazilian Paulus Mendes de Sohocha. Uh, but in temporary exhibitions, I increasingly began to think of the issue that I raised you at the very beginning, which is how I don't think that it's very interesting to place a quite mystifying model on a pedestal and say to the public, you figure it out. It's an object that is as mysterious as a Brancusi or a Juan Miro, etc. You figure it out. I think that the, to use the museum to mystify architecture is really to miss the potential of the museum to be a bridge 
between what goes on in this building, the incredible discussions that you have about how you try to figure out something, uh, how you try to solve a problem, how you debate possible solutions, uh, and, uh, and the public, uh, who often, I'm sorry to say, think of architects as arrogant people imposing their will on the public rather than <laughs> thinking of architects as people who bring a talent to a set of issues that are shared by all of us. So how can I then become a bridge between that profession and the public? How can the museum be that? How can the public understand what goes into both designing architecture but actually uh, making it? When I arrived at MoMA in 2007 was the, really the height of incredible excitement about the switch from uh, <coughs> Uh, digital de design to digital fabrication. It was really at the moment of euphoria over digital fabrication. Uh, and the notion that there was a complete paradigm shift with digital fabrication towards mass customization, which meant that there would be a rebirth of the dead project of the 20th century for prefabrication. And I wanted to look at this whole relationship between prefabrication and digital fabrication. I wanted to look at what was going on in changing the, the role of a designer uh, when one was uh, working for a production at a remote location. There were many, many issues in that that completely fascinated me. I also wanted to show my colleagues from Columbia School of Architecture where I had come uh, that the history of, history of architecture is a very dynamic process so that the uh, we understand the history of architecture always anew in relationship to what is important now. So that history is continually being rewritten. So I wanted to do an exhibition that was both on the contemporary challenges of digital fabrication and on a completely new rereading of the history of prefabrication in light of the changes <coughs> in fabrication methods brought on by the digital revolution. That does not sound like a topic that the public is dying to hear about, does it? It's vital absolutely important architectural culture. How to make that interesting for the public was my big um, issue. And I thought, well, one of the things that is absolutely characteristic of all of this is it completely changes the way of working, of thinking, and of producing uh, of uh, the designer. How can I make those ways of producing into the actual subject matter of an exhibition? The exhibition is usually the end product. It's not the process. How can I make an exhibition about uh, the process. So this is the exhibition that was staged both inside and out in the summer of 2008 called Home Delivery, Fabricating the Modern Dwelling. In the interior galleries of MoMA, I created a panorama that moved from some prototypes for digital fabricated walls by very young designers into a historical sequence of the evolution of thinking about a new relationship between the drafting board and the factory. And outside, I invited five teams of architects to produce a new prototype and to send it to uh, the museum of a prefabricated house, uh, digital or um, otherwise. There's the interior exhibition. I realized that doing a lot of research into the history of film would be absolutely essential so that the place was activated and one realized that what all these objects had in common was not that they were some new international style, that they were all part of some shared style, but they all had behind them the thinking of how do I produce an object for multiple fabrication where I am not the maker and I'm also not the person, I'm not creating a unique object. So this is the interior space uh, there, very complicated exhibition, but even more complicated was to be able to bring these five houses that represented five very, very different ways of thinking of then current, this is over this is over a decade old now. This is more or less the tenth anniversary of this show, it occurs to me. Uh, and I had this vacant lot. It's now got a one of the tallest buildings in New York by Jean Nouvel has occupied this space now, but I had this lot that I thought would be an outdoor architecture gallery in the tradition of the open air museum. But not of a nostalgia for the lost village, but a representation of what's happening now and what might be coming. Now my problem was once the buildings were moved there, people were just going to think this is an odd collection of objects in this parking lot. How are they going to understand the thought process that went into them? And then I realized that actually the internet is your friend. The digital technology and the museum are not in contradiction. What happens if we can merge them? 
So this exhibition <coughs> opened three months before it opened. We opened a website, we had a kind of vernissage for the website, and we had a second vernissage for the exhibition when it was finished, and we created this uh, website, it's still up and you can look at it, uh, for home delivery, it's a play on words, it's to deliver your house, literally. Uh, and so we, here we put a live camera, kind of Andy Warhol-like, on the site, and you could watch it. It was less exciting than the Empire State Building because nothing <laughs> happened. Nothing happened for days, for weeks, nothing happened. But it continued to play there. And then here we had, you could click on any one of these six boxes. This is kind of God created the world in six days and then he rested. Uh, the um, interesting thing, of course, about all prefabrication that it has in common is that the preparation of the site and the construction of the building are divorced from one another. This is a really radical thing that happens. So it's just the very beginning of how any kind of prefabricated or digital fabrication rewrites the very conditions of thinking architecture. Um, so how is the public going to follow that? So we asked each of the teams to post something once a week, little films and things. So you saw them having discussion and you could listen in. Then you saw them going to the factory and saying, we're going to do this. Then you saw it being loaded on a truck. Then you saw it going on a ship, because two of them came from uh, Europe, being on a ship coming into the port of New York. Then you saw a truck coming to the site. And finally, a few days before the exhibition opened, something finally started to happen on this screen. There were five houses, you might say there's six blocks on Saturday the two of us curators who were working on this posted what we were doing. So we actually made the show part of it. So this really goes to the idea of thinking how to make process part of the architectural uh, exhibition. And so you briefly two other complicated <coughs> projects, one of them quite uh, small in its space, but in a certain sense uh, big in its influence, as it turned out, uh, and the other one, one that just closed, which I'll only show you a few elements of, because I know the hour is late. This is a project that, in a certain sense, uh, grew out of the thinking about home delivery, about process, but took it to a new level, a level which I think you'll understand in a minute that I call extreme sports curating. Because in extreme sports curating, you do not know what you're going to show. You reserve the gallery, you pick a title, you invite <coughs> designers, but you don't know what you're going to show. It's like a, you know, it's just like jumping off a bridge with a bungee cord. You just, you know, they could let you down. They could create something that you think I cannot put what you just did in the Museum of Modern Art. What, uh, uh, what's going to happen? So here's the scenario. A brilliant engineer named Guy Nordensen came to me and said I had been working with a team, landscape designer, other architects, and people from all sorts of specializations, trying to think how we can make New York City more resilient for sea level rise. Because New York is one of about half the cities in the world that is likely to be partly underwater in the next couple of decades uh, with uh, rising sea levels. Here I am telling you this in Spain. Uh, you know, there are still the majority of us in America still do believe that this is a problem. Uh, and in fact, it is a very pressing, uh, uh, a very pressing problem. And Guy Nordenson said, um, I have this incredible uh, set of images that we've created, and we've done a large study on the, uh, on the issue, and we've suggested some first ideas of types of solutions. Why don't we show that at MoMA? And I said, I don't want to create a book on the wall. I mean, I'm not going to take the book that you're writing and reproduce it on the wall. That is the most boring approach to an exhibition. I said, what if we asked people to respond to this challenge and see what they came up with? And he said, really great idea. We were in Venice having coffee, delaying with our app, going into the uh, uh, Biennale. And he said, what if we asked people from the Netherlands to sh create projects for, um, for New York? I had the International Herald Tribune in front of me. It said Lehman Brothers had just collapsed. I said, OK, you're going to have out-of-work architects in New York by the end of the week, and you want me to ask the Dutch to come show us how to solve the problem. I think it's a very bad idea. We're going to have all sorts of people out of work. So we came up with this idea. Most of my titles have a kind of dual meaning. Rising currents with sea level coming up. But what we did was I went to the Rockefeller Foundation and convinced them to give me the money to invite five 
interdisciplinary teams to come into residence. We'll show you where in a moment. To come into residence in the Contemporary Art Center of MoMA, PS1, and to work on propositions of how to make five areas of the harbor of New York more resilient for sea level rise. This was a time in the aftermath of, uh, maybe we're going to get to this, here's the project, yeah, there's where they were going to be installed, yeah, here's the project, I thought I had an image to show you, but you have to realize that we are in the aftermath of uh, the flooding of New Orleans, and Guy Nordenson said the it, the real issue that we have is that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who are in charge of the water, uh, the coasts of America and protecting cities, uh, etc., all they believe in is concrete. All they believe in is hard solutions. So we need to be thinking also of soft infrastructure. We need to expand the idea of infrastructure to take in ecology, landscape design, uh, and the like. So this exhibition was a critique, really, of uh, the status quo, uh, and an attempt to say, we're going to actually have to learn to live with the water, but there are ways that we can ameliorate uh, through a whole range of techniques. So this was a, an attempt to try that out. Uh, and what we did was we put out a call, and anybody who could come with a dream team that would include many disciplines that they might not normally work with in their architectural project, maybe hydrologists, uh, ecologists, etc. Uh, as long as it was an interdisciplinary team, we gave them a studio at MoMA PS1. We gave them enough money to buy all the Coca-Cola and potato chips that they could ever want. And we um, started to, once a week, invite in experts. We got hydrologists from Stony Brook University. We got in, and we started to invite city officials to talk to them as their projects were involving. So we got a conversation going between the city between experts and between the, these groups. There were about, about 15 uh, people in each team. And then three times during the course of this six-week workshop, we had an open door day, and we invited the public in so that they could come and discuss and see. Most people have never seen an architectural studio. They somehow think that architecture just magically appears. They've not uh, participated in the culture that you have here of a pinup. So it's fascinating for the public to come in and have discussions uh, with these, uh, this group. Finally, I realized that what we needed to do was record it, so we started to record them, the work underway, so that by the time it moved to the gallery, we had film of the process of it coming into being, and we opened a website, too, where the public could continue to uh, comment on it, and this was the exhibition of the five different sites. So now you know that the first image was, was a way of creating a green skirt around Lower Manhattan in order to have a kind of absorptive ground to not only deal with rising sea level, but also to break the impact of storm surge, of water that suddenly flows in uh, as it did. This was in 2010. Two years to the day after this exhibition closed, Hurricane Sandy flooded New York. And this image, which had been in the press before the exhibition opened, reappeared in the New York Times two years later. So the exhibition started to have extraordinary staying power. This is one of the most extraordinary projects, which was to convert a whole part of the waterworks into a oyster uh, bed, uh, because oysters do two wonderful things. One, they clean an enormous amount of water, and two, they create reefs. So they create, actually, a, uh, a better bathymetry we all learned all these new words, bathymetry. We were, by the end of it, we're going around there. So, do you have a good course bathymetry? What are you doing for breaking wave <laughs> oscillation at the bottom of your thing? And the, uh, at the end, there's a kind of group that came out of this. So unlike Henry Russell Hitchcock, Phil Johnson, 1932, identifying a tendency out there, we almost have the graduating class that not only talk about soft infrastructure, they talk about the experience of realizing that there's no boundary to the project between the land and the sea. What does it mean when you erase that boundary? So it, this little exhibition uh, created, uh, this is the image that ultimately we're going to eat these oysters. And then people were so interested in it, we decided to take it out to, into the uh, sites themselves. So we mounted a version of the exhibition on a boat and invited the architects to go out and we visited the sites and looked and talked at them about them together. Two years later, we did another project on the foreclosure crisis and rethinking the urban edge. I'm not going to go into this because I think I've 
kept you here, even though you eat lunch late in Spain, I think it's probably approaching. Uh, this one, same procedure, but then this is an open house day. Who begins to, this is Jeannie Gang, she did one of the projects. This is the Dean of School of Architecture at Harvard, but this guy showed up, who was the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development at the time in the Obama administration. Uh, and um, I had actually said, if you could come, it would be great. He was going to be in New York City. He came. He said that morning, uh, I'd like to, uh, I think I'd like to give a policy address. I thought, oh no, this is really getting out of hand. And then he said, could we wait 15 minutes? I'm going to write a speech with my uh, comments on what I just saw and what we need to do in relationship to what you're showing. So all of this is to say that in the tradition of the, act the activist uh, exhibition, which I steal, from my heroine, Catherine Bauer, the idea that the museum can instigate public debate, much as it did in the 18th century when the first projects went in, uh, and begin to not only influence public opinion in terms of elected officials, but also to create a place for a very, very lively debate, and I hope create a place in which the public doesn't stand in awe in front of an architectural project they can't understand, but rather gets engaged in thinking about how design thinking uh, works. So, had I more time, and I'll just give you a few notes on this to conclude, uh, this was the last large exhibition that I did at MoMA. As you can see, it closed last autumn. The background to this is that in 2012, uh, I culminated something that happened, started with a phone call a few years earlier. Uh, we took possession of the entire archive of Frank Lloyd Wright and moved it into a very unusual arrangement where it is shared between the um, Columbia University's Architecture Library and the Museum of Modern Art. I think maybe this is even a question for you uh, to think about. Uh, what's the role of architectural archives? What's the role of these architectural collections? In this case, more or less the complete production of Frank Lloyd Wright. Talking about 27,000 drawings, 50,000 photographs, 100 models, go on and on and on, all of his correspondence. So here's the New York Times announcing it. We promised that we would do an exhibition uh, within five years, a major exhibition. The foundation, who Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, who had seeded the collection to us, said that'll be easy, you'll do masterpieces from the Frank Lloyd Wright archive. I said, that is the most boring title I have ever thought of. I think everybody knows that there are masterpieces by Frank Lloyd Wright. That's not a problem, that's not new information. Uh, I don't think that we went to all the trouble to bring two enormous truckloads, I'm talking those long trucks you see on the highway, to New York, right in the middle of Hurricane Sandy, uh, in order to show that they're masterpieces. But at the same time, I'm not a scholar of Frank Lloyd Wright. I don't have some great new insight into the entire meaning of this architect who lived in 90 years of age and practiced therefore for nearly 70 years. What am I going to say that's going to totally change the view of an architect on whom there are over 800 books already published. And I came up with the idea of doing an exhibition called Unpacking the Archive. So I'll just finish with this. Here we are literally unpacking the archive. <laughs> this is, now unpacking in English has two meanings. So here we are working with the students in the archives, restoring the models, and the, these are some of the exhibitions that we did. I'm going to get into this unpacking idea. Here's Unpacking the Archive. Unpacking has two meanings in English. In literally to take things out of their boxes, but also to interpret something, to ask questions, to figure it out. So I was intrigued, I'm going to, these are some, these are some of the masterpieces they were in the show to be sure. Um, if any of you want to work on Frank Lloyd Wright, the archive is now open and waiting for you. Let me just go zip ahead, these are some views of it. So let's look at this one, this is interesting. So what I had, and the idea that I really just wanted to work on one drawing, a mile high skyscraper, completely intrigued me. Why was Frank Lloyd Wright, Mr. Anti-Urbanist, Mr. Broadacre City, designing a mile high skyscraper? What was that about? I just wanted to interpret one drawing, but I had 12,000 square feet of gallery to fill. So I came up with the idea that maybe there would be 13 other people who would be equally obsessed with trying to figure out one thing. And then I thought, if they're obsessed with trying to figure out one thing, what we can do is we'll film them in the archive while they're figuring it out, and we'll make an exhibition about historical research. 
I've been working so much on showing how architects and designers work, new configurations for thinking, new alliances with different disciplines. What about now, since I'm a historian, what if I make an exhibition about how a historian works? So that's what we did. Uh, and for instance, this is Mabel Wilson, one of my colleagues at Columbia. Um, you'll see her in a minute. Uh, she wrote a really beautiful book called Negro Building, which is about pavilions for African Americans at World's Fairs in the late 19th and early 20th century. One day, out of a dossier falls this drawing for a model school for African American children in the south of the United States by Frank Lloyd Wright. So I texted her and I said, Mabel, do you know anything about Frank Lloyd Wright designing schools for African American children? She said, I'll be right down. She came to the archive. So would you like to figure this out? I'll give you a gallery if you'll figure this out. This is extreme sports curating with the historical bent. Uh, and so Mabel starts to, and so we film Mabel figuring it out in the archive, uh, and she's getting things out of the archive, and she's saying, but then if we want to understand this, it occurred to me I should look at his other kindergartens, and then I went to these other archives, and then I started to find photographs of Booker T. Washington, one of the great pioneers, uh, asking for educational opportunities for Americans with the guy who donated the money, and then she said, I realized it's connected to the grants that paid for many of the works by African-American artists in MoMA's collection. Uh, and so suddenly, she, through her thought process, begins to, these photographs are at the Museum of Modern Art, she begins to bring many parts of the collection together in order to solve the issue of how do I understand a very little known project by Frank Lloyd Wright. So the public has to enter her gallery by first meeting her and hearing her talk about it, otherwise there's no way they're going to understand why all of these objects are together. So there, in a certain sense, um, we could say, I was trying to think about a way in which the curator, as historian thinker, uh, could also be present in the gallery. So that's not a conclusion. I just tried to show you some aspects of how I tried to build on what I see as a 250-year history of the impossible task of making an architecture exhibition, and how, in turn, I have come to the conclusion that the architecture exhibition has all sorts of possibilities for uh, putting on display the very heart of architecture, even if we can't put architecture as a building into the gallery. So I'll stop there.